do something. والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض Perhaps we can close that door and open the other one so we don't have this traffic jam over here and put the, put the, the, put the, seat, put the chair in front of the door there and then open that door Thank you. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad The pagan Arabs never had a prophet amongst them. And now a man from within their own midst, who they respected, they even honored him. He was so honest and so trustworthy and so truthful. They called him Al-Ameen. He was married to a wealthy woman <clears throat> and uh, he was held in esteem, he belonged to the Quraysh, he belonged to Banu Hashim, he held a very respectable position in society. And now he declares, I am a prophet, like there were prophets before. And they knew about Ibrahim alayhi salam. They knew about his haq alayhi salam, they knew about his ma'il alayhi salam. They had contact with the Jews who were just next door in Yathrib, Medina. How can we tell whether he is indeed a prophet? So they sent a delegation to the, to the rabbis in Medina. The rabbis responded, by saying, ask him these three questions which only a prophet can answer, which only a prophet can answer. In other words, knowledge externally acquired cannot deliver the answers. Only a prophet can answer. Ask him about the young man and the cave. Ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the earth and ask him about the Ruh. When they came back, the Quraysh then came to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and said, if you are indeed a prophet, answer these three questions. And he says, I'll answer you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We are told that he forgot to say, inshallah. There could be more to it than meets the eye. That inshallah has a pivotal role to play. <laughs> in the story which now unfolds, namely the signs of the last day. And insha'Allah is also to be found there in the digging of the wall. We now recognize it, that an age is going to come when this sacred vocabulary will not just disappear from civilized discourse, civilized conversation. You can't be a diplomat and say, inshallah, you'll be fired. <laughs> you can't be a diplomat and speak about alhamdulillah and subhanallah. 
and astaghfirullah, foreign officer call you back home. Hmm? You can't use this kind of vocabulary and survive in big business. No. An age is going to come when, when this vocabulary will disappear. These pious expressions will disappear. And this is the trademark. The word insha'Allah is used as a trademark by which you'll be able to recognize the subject which now unfolds. Are we in that age today? Most certainly we are. Jibra'il al Islam kept him waiting for two weeks before the answers were revealed. And there are some people who don't have patience. I better not mention any names, I could be in trouble. <laughs> there are some people who have a shortage of patience. They can't wait. And so they come to conclusion right away and they rejected Islam. Yes, they did that in Medina. They rejected Islam because he could not give the answer and they couldn't wait. And there were others who were mocking. Look at him, he cannot answer. So we have secured a victory here. Hmm? But we know that Allah is with those who are patient. And if you wait long enough, the truth will come. And so the answers did come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta sent down the answers. But significantly, two of the answers were placed in Surah al but the third was put in Surah to Bani Israel. That could not be my accident. Mulana Abu Ala Mauduri is a very learned scholar of Islam and we have respect for him, for his scholarship as a servant, a sincere servant of Allah. He was persuaded for reasons best known to him that the third had to be in Surah al because the other two were there. So he decided that the third answer to the third question was to be found in the story of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam. Hmm? And he put that down in his tafsir, tafsir al Quran. We respect the Mawlana. We respect the ulama, the people of knowledge. And uh, <clears throat> we mean no disrespect when we say, Mawlana, you are wrong. Allah put the third answer in Surah to Bani Israel, and He did it for a reason that there is a link between Surah to Kaf and Surah to Bani Israel. That the subject of Islamic eschatology is to be found primarily in Surah to Kaf and in Surah to Bani Israel. So these two surahs are linked with each other. To find some of the answers posed in Surah to Kaf, you go to Surah to Bani Israel. <clears throat> the third question was asking about the Ruh. And the answer given to the question delivers a warning to us to be careful, to be careful. Allah says that after He created Adam alayhi salam, when a fakhtu fihi, mean? Ruhi. And I, when I fuck to his first person, when I fuck to fihi, and I breathed into him of my ruh. My ruh. So there is a divine ruh. The Hindus call it Paramatma. So he also has ruh. 
So there is a divine ruh, and this is breathed into the human being. So there is ruh in the human being. <coughs> but then he also has said, Tanazzalu al-malaikatu wa ruh that on that night the angels and the ruh descend. وَأَيَّدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ And we strengthened him with the holy, or they call it the holy ghost, <laughs> the holy ruh. <laughs> and the Christians call it the holy ghost. So, which one? We have three here. We have Allah's ruh. We have the human ruh. We have Jibra'il alayhi salam who is Ruh. So it's a tricky question. Does he know about all of this? Will he be able to answer? How will he answer? Hmm? Ask him about the Ruh. And the answer comes down. And listen to how the answer comes down. Allah first repeats the question and then gives the answer. This must not escape your attention. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْرُوح And they question thee about the ruh. And then he gives the answer. And then when Allah addressed the question about the great traveler to give the answer, he first repeats the question and then gives the answer. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ And they question thee about so and so. And then proceeds to give the answer. I wonder why he didn't do that for question one. Huh? Is it by accident? could not be by accident. Nothing <coughs> happens in this Quran by accident. Hmm? There must be a reason why. He does not repeat the question in giving the answer for question one about the young man and the king. When he answers the question concerning the Ruh. He delivers an answer which silences them. Kul ruhu min amri rabbi. Amr is command. Order. Say to them. Say this to them. Say only this to them. Say nothing more than this to them that the Ruh is by Allah's command. And that silenced them. There's nothing more. وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And insofar as this subject is concerned, <laughs> you have only little knowledge. I have given you only little knowledge. This occurred a few years before. This, this occurred while we were still in Mecca, before the Hijrah. We know that the answer reached them in Medina. We know that. Because when we arrived in Medina, they came to him and they asked, When your Lord said that you have only little knowledge of this subject. Who was he referring to? Was he referring to us, the chosen people of Allah for whom heaven is reserved, the elite of mankind, all the rest are cockroaches? Or was he referring to them, the cockroaches, the ummiyun? And the answer stunned them. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu was he was referring to both of you. Both of you. 
which means that we who have the Quran, we who have Muhammad sallallahu we have more knowledge than they have on the subject of the end time. What a pity it is that at the time we should be we should be intellectually leading the world in explaining the strange events unfolding in the world. At the time we should be leading the world in our analysis of what is happening in the world of politics, what is happening in the economy, what is happening in the world of money, what is happening in terms of power politics in the world. When we should be leading the world in anticipating events which are to unfold. When we should be leading the world in informing the world where they are going. Ours is a voice which seems to be, should I say it? I don't know, they're eating halwa. What's happened? Where is the voice of Islam? What has happened to the learned and distinguished scholars of Islam? What has happened? وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا indicating that there is more knowledge here than amongst you, the chosen, so-called chosen people. With this marvelous introduction to the subject, we now proceeded to Surah al -Kaf and to the story of the young men in the cave. But we said, no, let's not do that. Since this was <coughs> we should go now to <coughs> for continuity. Hmm? Are you following There is similarity in the manner in which these two questions are answered. So if we start with this one, we should go to this one now. So we leave the young men in the cave for last. And we will explain to you why we are doing it. We go now to the great traveler, which we did about two days, three days ago. And uh, we found that in giving the answer to this question, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not stop at the second journey. They had only asked about two journeys, the two ends of the earth. But we are being taught a lesson now that when these fellows ask a question, the target of the question is not in the question. The target of the question is elsewhere. And you have to be able to discern what is the target of the question. So you're dealing with very clever people. Allah speaks about the third journey. That's what you wanted to know about, the third journey. Although it's not there in the question. And at the end of the third journey, we reached one of the major signs of Allah, of the ten, Gog and Magog. So now we know that the target of the question was Gog and Magog. Not the traveler, Gog and Magog which only a prophet would know about, Gog and Magog. When we now turn to question one, if 
the first question was meant to puzzle him, set a trap for him. That was the ordeals. And the second question had as its target one of the major signs of Allah. It follows therefrom that the third question must also have as its target one of the major signs of the last day. Hmm? Because only a prophet would be able to answer it. The story of the young men in the cave must have been known to many people. <coughs> Even Edward Gibbons wrote about it in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. So that could not be the target. Why? Because only a prophet can answer it. So then what is the target of the question in number one, the young men and the king? It has to be one of the signs of the last day that only a prophet can answer. They know about it because they had prophets coming to them in an unbroken line from the time of Musa alayhi salam to the time of Isa alayhi salam, said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. So they are privy to this knowledge which they keep concealed. And so now we have to put on our thinking gaps. What could be the target of the first question? Allah answered the one about the roof. He answered the one about the great traveler. But where is the answer to the one about the young men in the cave? In answering the question, he gives us the historical data. Yeah, which was known to many people that they were young men and they had faith. And these were rabbis are Jews, aren't they? They're not Christians, are they? Come on, tell me. In Medina, they were Jews or Christians? Jews. Jews, right? So if these young men were Christians, the rabbis would want to conceal that, wouldn't they? Because Allah is obviously with the Christians. So how could these young men be Christians? Huh? And yet in all the tafasir they are Christians. <laughs> Except Muhammad Asad. <coughs> because Muhammad Asad, Rahimahullah, was born of Jewish parents, who were rabbis, who was brought up to be a rabbi, and who was 22 years of age as a Correspond, political correspondent of a Jew, German newspaper in Arabia when he converted and became Muslim. Hmm? It was Muhammad, Ra uh, Muhammad Asad who said, no, they are not Christians, they are Jews. Hmm? <coughs> These young men, free from a society which was blaspheming, and this was well known. And they fled to the cave, and the miracle occurred, and it was well known. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala went on to give some more information that they didn't have. It must have stunned them when they heard it. Because I don't think the prophets informed them about the dog. If I could speak with them, and if they would be truthful to me, which I don't think they will, I believe we can confirm that they did not have information about the dog. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down in Surah al of the Qur'an the bare history of the subject, but includes the dog, 
and includes the dog lying at the center of the entrance of the cave and even describes how he was lying with his front legs stretched out in front of him. It, these meticulous details must have shaken the Jews. Hmm? But the target of the question could not have been something located in the historical record. The dog could not have been the target of the question. It had to be something located in the end times, because Gog and Magog is in the end times. So what could have been the target of the question? We have come to the conclusion, this is our conclusion, no one has to accept it. We have come to the conclusion that the rabbis wanted to know whether he knew about the child. I don't know what name they have for him, but whoever, whatever name they have for him, the Israeli Mossad is the best student he has. The Israeli Mossad has learned all their tricks from him. And indeed the Israeli Mossad has it, his motto. What is it? By way of deception. <laughs> the child has a PhD in deception. It's a book by that name. Oh. Now, there's a book by that name as well. Now, we have come to the conclusion that the target is the child. But in Surah Al Kaf, Allah does not does not make any direct mention of the target of the question. In other words, he left them guessing. And that is how the subject of the Jal is dealt with in Islam and in the Quran. All the references to the Jal all the data pertaining to the Dajjal are all of this nature that if you want to use ordinary reason and logic, if you want to use only external observation, you will end up with a flying donkey. And how embarrassing is going to, it is going to be. And I am not being disrespectful to my brothers, the learned scholars of Islam. How embarrassing it's going to be when on Judgment Day you learn that you are using the Jal's money and you never even knew it. And when he changed from the paper currencies to the invisible money, the electronic money, you were stamping it with your fatwa of halal and you never knew it was the child's money. That you had abandoned the sunna money, the gold dinar and silver dirham, and you'd never lifted even your little finger to where you struggled to bring back the sunna money. How embarrassing it is going to be on Judgment Day. Sorry, no, before Judgment. When this fellow stands up in Jerusalem and declares that he is the Messiah and all the evidence points to him that he is indeed the Dajjal. But you go to him and you say to him, excuse me sir, you say you are the Messiah. I believe you are the false Messiah, but I have a problem. Where is your flying donkey? <laughs> It's going to be embarrassing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the subject is hidden in the Quran. And we came across this word in that ayah of Surah Al Isra. Wa min qariyatin 
إلا نحن مهلكوها قبل يوم القيامة أو معذبوها عذابا شديدا وكان ذلك في الكتاب مستورا كان ذلك في الكتاب مستورا so there are subjects in the Quran which are mustur Dajjal <laughs> Dajjal is most certainly mustur in the Quran but it is there and so the answer is given in Surah Al-Kaf and it is given in a way to warn us warn us Surah Al-Kaf is warning us that the greatest fitna that mankind will ever experience from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day is a fitna that will attack you in a manner that it will be difficult for you to recognize it. You will not be able to recognize it using the left eye alone. You also need the right eye. Excuse me, sir, you say that you are the Messiah. I suspect that you are the false Messiah. But how come you have two eyes? You see the problem? Because the prophet said you have only one eye, but you have two. The subject has to be addressed in a different way. You need a different epistemology and Surah Al-Kaf comes to deliver that epistemology in the story of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam that Musa alayhi salam using the conventional methodology of knowledge externally acquired and formulating judgment on external observation hmm? comes to the conclusion on all three occasions and on all three occasions his conclusion and his judgment is wrong. But another man comes along and he gives the right answer. And Allah says to Musa alayhi salam, there is a servant of mine more learned than you are. He says, I want to meet him. And the answer comes that you will meet him at Majma'u Bahrain, the place where the two oceans meet. And I pointed out to you Imam al-Baydawi, who gave us this lovely explanation that the two oceans are the ocean of knowledge externally acquired and the ocean of knowledge internally received. And when these two oceans of knowledge have Majma'a, when they are harmoniously integrated in an individual, then you have a khidr, alayhi salam. The knowledge descends upon such a person. Such a person sees with the nur of Allah. So Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran is telling us that you will not be able to understand the world in the age of the Dajjal, in the end times. Because he will be the mastermind of the world at that time. You will not be able to understand the world at that time. You will not be able to explain the world and you will not be able to respond to the challenges of the world at that time unless and until you change your methodology unless and until you adopt this epistemology that knowledge comes from both the external and the internal and this is why when Mawlana Fadur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah established the Alimi Institute of Islamic Studies in Karachi, Pakistan and we were so fortunate to be his students we couldn't understand why was this man so emphatic about the spiritual quest being the foundation of knowledge. I, for one, I rejected it at the age of 21, 22. I said, listen, I could handle that later on in life. 
At this time, let me devote myself to the pursuit of knowledge. As though the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of spirituality were two separate things, divorced from each other. Yes, this, is, this was the conclusion I arrived at, at the very green age of 22. What well, Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah was teaching us was that you need a foundation of spirituality in order to be able to advance in the world of knowledge. <coughs> but there was that knowledge which was traditional. But in addition to that, here is a modern age. And he chose to call it, the study of the modern age, he chose to call it, what did he call it, Ali Mustafa? He's gone falling asleep, his feet. He didn't get enough sleep. Short supply in this retreat. He called it, where is Muhammad Ali Khan? Huh? There, yeah. what did he call it? Modern? Modern? Modern thought. See, he didn't get enough sleep, he didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> Call it modern thought. All right. That was his choice. I, I don't use that term. But my teacher called it modern thought. And Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies was established in order to not only teach the traditional Islamic disciplines, but also introduce the student to modern thought. The other Darulums looked at us. <laughs> what is that? It's neither fish nor fowl. <laughs> I leave the institute. They caricatured us. These fellows out there in the Alimi Institute. He is not Maulana. Because you know nowadays, I don't know if you heard about it. There's such a thing as a Alim course, huh? Yes. You don't believe me? There is such a thing as an Alim course and there is an examination you have to pass to be a Maulana. You didn't hear it? You didn't hear it? Yes. And if you pass the exam, you are Maulana. Sometimes I can't help myself and I have to use language that I afterwards regret. This is stupidness. This is stupidity. There's no such thing as an adding course. <laughs> never been. <laughs> never will be. You don't graduate to be an adding. No. <laughs> it's nonsense. So they say, who are these fellas? Is this an adding It's neither fish nor fowl. They're teaching modern thought. Didn't they know that English is the language of the Kofar? You're not supposed to study English. You're not supposed to have English education. Hmm? Well, how else are you going to study the modern age? So, we have, we have in Surah al in Majma'ul Bahrain, the epistemology given to us by Surah al the the uh, not inescapable, the indispensable, you can't do without it, the indispensable methodology for the study of the modern age. Is this the age of Dajjal? All, all that you need to do is to ask him, Maulana, did he not say, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, that the last people, remember the last people, eh? not the first, the last to come out of the Jal will be woman, and that the man will have to return to his home and tie down, meaning coercively restrain his wife and sister and daughter to protect them from the fitna of the child, from being deceived by the child. Maulana, did he not also say about the world of women at that time that women would be dressed and yet naked? 
Is this not here now? Can you not see the evidence that this is linked to Dajjal? Hmm? If we are living in the age of Dajjal, then you better watch that money that you're using in your pocket, in your wallet. If we are living in the age of Dajjal, then you better watch the electoral process, voting in elections. If we are living in the age of Dajjal, then you need this epistemology delivered by Surat al -Kaf in order to be able to be equipped to study the world today. Knowledge externally acquired, knowledge internally received, and the two being harmoniously integrated with each other. Surah Al-Kaf of the Quran thus answered the questions of the rabbis, the Jews. But put a question mark behind the young men in the cave. So up to now they're guessing. They don't know how much we know. But in the process of answering the questions, the surah also gave to us very important information. For example, that in the end time, in the tumultuous end times, when there will be such great, great, great challenges and such grave danger, who are those who are most likely to respond to the call? The young men, not the older ones, the young men. In Nahum, as uh, Hasbullah so beautifully expressed last night, إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ مَهُدًا These were the ones who gave up their jobs. These are the ones who gave up their homes with refrigerators and televisions and microwave and... Dishwasher. They are dishwasher. <laughs> These are the ones who put their passports behind them. And these are the ones, these are the ones who fled, who disconnected, who withdrew. One in a thousand will do that. And the one in a thousand who will do that will be more likely than not a young person. Look at how important is this information for the leader who is leading a jama'ah in this age, <coughs> the young ones. But then Surah al kaf also told us something else about the young ones. What was it? I've been talking for too long. Mm -hmm. Let me hear you. <coughs> Here was the young one who were the ones who would show the courage, the backbone to stand up and proclaim the truth in the face of the oppressor, in the face of those who were worship, worshipping other than Allah, and to disconnect from that godless world. But there are other young ones in the in Surah al -Kaf. Where is Masabo? Where is Masabo? Where is Masabo? Oh, he's there. He has his head bent down. <laughs> Come on, Masabo, let's have you. Young one, a young one, a young one. Surah al -Kaf. You had breakfast this morning. <laughs> oh, you... <laughs> There is a reference in Surah al -Kaf to young ones in the plural, in the young men in the cave. And they displayed this trademark as being the ones more likely than not to stand up for Allah with courage and integrity. In Surah al to a young one. 
Is your name Asabo? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> then who will answer? Uh, the young boy that That's right. Uh, That's right. Khidr alayhi salam killed the boy. He killed the boy. And explained to Musa alayhi salam afterwards <laughs> that this young man had parents who had faith in Allah. But his belief and conduct was such that it posed a threat to his own parents. It is not that the parents were trying to change their son and incrementally making some progress and getting him to come back to the right path. So don't give up on him. It was the other way around. That in the end times, you can lose your children in such a way that it is not only a hope Less cause to bring them back to the path of Islam and to the Sunnah of the Prophet but more than that that your young ones are going to pose a threat to you and your faith and therefore to the faith of the society that the young ones are going to demolish your faith-based society. The ambassador is shaking his head because he knows what's happening in Malaysia. That's happening in Malaysia now. That you spend all these generations building a society on values that come from Allah. And then within a generation or two, a strange and mysterious disease takes over the young ones. And you not only lose them, they not only join the Blue Jeans Jamaat, but they now pose a threat to the society based on faith in Allah. Hmm. So Surah al Kaf is doing a wonderful job here in introducing us to the modern age and in warning us of what to expect in the modern age. The, if you um, were not here when I spoke about a cup of tea that my wife Aisha is going to make, then you can answer the question. But if you were here at that time, don't answer because you already know the answer. Okay? When the retreat began, I said, I have a challenge for you. I want to know what is the connection between Surat al Kef and the experience of the local Muslim community in Simon's town. Is there any connection between the two? Who would like to answer that question? Uh, we, we, this is the second cup. You can do the first cup, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the second cup of tea that I shall have to make. If you answer it correctly. Anyone? Yes? There is a connection between Surah al -Kaf, something in Surah al -Kaf of the Quran, and the experience of the local Muslim community in Simonstown. Not just Simonstown, but also in South Africa and so on, Cape Town. But because we are here in Simonstown, we choose Simonstown. What is it? Yes? What did you say? The rich and the poor. The difference between the rich man and the poor man. 
Simon Scott. No, that's not the answer I was looking for. Anyone else? Is it about hospitality? Yes. It's about uh, young men, uh, which is mentioned in the... The young man? The, 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 a few young men uh -huh. who uh, uh, go to the camp. They went to the cave? Yeah. yeah. No, that's not the answer. Mm -hmm. Yes? A naval base in Simon's town. Yeah, no, that's not the answer. Hold on, hold on, hold on. The two seas coming together. No, that's not the answer. We are so fortunate, huh? <laughs> to have a whole class pursuing PhDs in sophisticated guesswork. <laughs> yes, sisters, come on, yes. from my wife Aisha? <laughs> yes. Yes, another? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. That is like uh, um, when uh, Musa and Hitler and Islam, they um, made a wall mm -hmm. and they didn't give them... To nah, the wall, they built the wall. That's not the answer. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I just think, um, this is about the, the travel driving out of your land or something like a tree, something takes over your land and you allow it. I want something, I don't want the word land, I want something else. Go ahead, come on. No, Surat will end, Surat will come, go ahead. Look at them, they don't like Aisha's tea. You don't drink tea, okay. No, we have, we have, she, we have Shekhali Mustafa's wife here, Karima, so she'll make you Moroccan coffee. <laughs> Yes. Are you going to mention the two mountain passes? No. No. And I'm very sure that they're allowing the intruders of the Dajjal to take over and that they're taking over the land. I don't know what. No. Yes. But in regards to you, you said Dajjal will be in every city and every town and not the villages. Ah. Simon Town is a town. Yes. Yeah. It's a town. Yeah. Where we should locate ourselves towards villages instead. Okay, no, that's not the answer. Yes? Uh, is it that uh, the, the Native American community represents the, the young men, uh -huh. and the Malaysia represents the community that they've left behind? Mm -hmm. And they've kind of grown us here and have gone back to Malaysia, giving back, perhaps uh, rebuilding Malaysia. Very imaginative, eh? <laughs> I wish I could record all of these answers. <laughs> yes. Very imaginative answers I'm getting here. This class has the imagination in it, yes? Anybody else? Did the local community... He was here in a boy. Huh? <laughs> Kill the boy. Kill the boy. No, that's not the answer, yes? Is the new lady and the... Ah, no? No, no, no. Next, next one. <laughs> the answer is in the story of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam. The, yes. But you were here, so you were here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You were here? Yes, he was here. You were not here? All right, all right. We give him a chance. Go ahead, let me hear you. If you give the, get the right answer, and you're already here, you're not going to find the tea, yeah? All right, go ahead, let me hear you. <laughs> what is the tea you have? <laughs> let's hear you, Masabo, come on. I don't know if I was here, but... All right, let's hear you. Never mind. The appearance and the reality are opposite. Appearance and reality are opposite to each other in Simon's tongue. Good try. <laughs> Good try, my Good try. Yes, that's very correct, yeah? No, no, it is in the story of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam. 
where the poor people had a boat. A boat. And an oppressive power came and seized their boat. All their boats were being seized. Hmm? And you had a Muslim community here in Simon's Town, which was not wealthy, they were fishermen, most of them. And they had their houses right around the bay here. And an oppressive government came, a wicked government came and seized their boats, meaning their houses. And today they look at the spot. This is where my house was. That is where he lived. That is where he lived. They can see it. But it's been seized from them. And they can't get it back. So Surah Tul Kaf comes to give some comfort to such people whose hearts are still bleeding. Only twelve families now remain in Simon's town. Only twelve. And the reason why they remained in Simon's town was because the oppressive force, the government that seized properties, needed them because they had some certain skills that were required. So you were allowed to continue to live here because of the skills that you have, you see? Otherwise you too would have been packed out of town. So when this, when this, the Muslims of Simon's town, when they look at that boat, and of course you know when I use the word boat, I mean a house. When I look at my boat out there, and my heart is bleeding, this is my property. I've lived there for a hundred years. I can't get it back. So little calf of the Quran will come to bring comfort to their heart. That not in this age, my son, not in this, this is a different age, my son and my daughter. This is an age in which power lies on foundations that are godless. And power is used to oppress. The only time that you will get back your property is when this power is destroyed. You're not going to get it back to the court. When this power is destroyed and the sun comes up again and there's sunshine on the earth and the rain falls and washes away all this filth hmm? and that will come only at the end of history. When Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns and he kills the child and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys Gog and Magog or some of it Nadin can't do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys Gog and Magog. And then the Muslim army will do the mopping up operation. And the Islamic State of Israel, Holy Israel, will be restored. That would be the Khilafah in Jerusalem. And at that time, the world will then experience the world that they had at the time of Zulkarnay. Okay, what's the time? Anybody? 1040. 1040? Is that so? Yeah. And the photograph is at 11? We only have 20 minutes. Okay. So let us pause for questions.